Hi everyone, welcome to our new lecture. Today we will cover control flow. So let's talk about, until now we talked about parsing and how a program basically is compiled into an Apsta syntax tree or some internal representation. But we didn't really talk about execution of programs. So in order to understand execution of programs and actually what programs mean, today we will talk about the different semantics of programming languages. So programming languages from the beginning, they were mapped to a semantics, usually in some kind of mathematical formalism. And uh, in fact, the order that we have here, the different types of, of semantics that we have in programming languages, is not really the historical order. Initially, people thought about using functions for defining basically the meaning of programs. Uh, in fact, even before functions, if we think about uh, history, uh, there was logic and how to specify basically everything in some kind of first order logic or mathematical logic. However, most programming languages today follow another kind of semantics uh, called operational semantics. Basically, uh, it gives how a program would execute on a machine to behave uh, basically uh, based on a set of instructions. So this is the imperative meaning of the program. The program, the machine can be abstract like a Turing machine and it can be defined uh, formally, like Turing machines, based on the input on the tape, what's the next step to actually execute. Like move to the next, move to the uh, location, move to the back location, change the value on the tape, and so on. So in this case, for Turing machines and operational semantics, uh, the control flow is very important. The fact that instructions are executed in order, that methods are executed in order and so on. There are other types of semantics for programming languages. Uh, most important for functional languages, for instance, is the denotational semantics, where every phrase in the language is interpreted as a denotation, which is a conceptual meaning of a mathematical object in a mathematical space. For instance, the denotational semantics of functional languages often translates uh, uh, the language into a domain theory or basically as functions from states to states. Now, if we think about logic programming, the logic programming semantics is defined using a model theory in logic. Uh, this is called axiomatic semantics. It maps the language statements to some logic. First of the logic most of the time, but there are also defeasible uh, reasoning logics, non-monotonic logics, and so on. So, in fact, in the, in, in the case of logic programming, the axiomatical semantics, the model theory, uh, is, is, it's basically what can we prove from the statements or from the formulas, logical formulas in the program. Now, a programming language may have, in fact, multiple uh, semantics. For instance, if we talk about logic programming, the model theory is the set of logical consequences of the program. But usually, uh, programming languages from logic programming, like, for instance, um, uh, Prolog, has also an operational semantics. And operational semantics is how do you compute that set of logical consequences uh, imperatively in a program, either starting from the goal that's goal directed or uh, directed or uh, top down resolution, or starting from the rules and the facts that you have in the database and computing everything else that can be inferred from the database. That's a bottom up approach. But in all of these cases, we basically, we prove that the logical uh, operational semantics is sound and complete with respect to the model theory, the axiomatical semantics. So today we'll talk about semantics of, of programs, and we'll talk about what are the different ways to implement semantics, especially in uh, imperative languages that follow this kind of operational semantics. We'll talk about the differences between expressions and statements. Statements do not return a value. There are languages that make a very well distinction between statements and 
and expressions. Many languages don't, like for instance C and uh, Java, you can actually write expressions as statements and they will execute. In fact, some statements also return values, like for instance the assignment statement. It returns the value of the variable after it was assigned a value. So today we'll talk about these semantics problems and control flow in languages. So what exactly is control flow? We mentioned it earlier. It's actually the ordering of the program execution. And there are different ordering, ordering mechanisms in programming languages. Most common one in imperative languages, procedural programming, is sequencing. Uh, the statements are executed in order as they appear in the program, or for instance inside the method, like the main method. Then we have selection or alternation, or uh, conditional statements, where we make a choice based on some condition, and we basically execute a statement or a different statement, depending on the value of the condition. Like, for instance, in if statements, in switch case statements. Another ordering mechanism, control flow mechanism, is iteration. A fragment of the, a code that is re uh, executed repeatedly, uh, a certain number of times or until a certain condition is true. And that includes for loops, do while loops, repeat loops in C. Then we have procedural abstraction, where we have basically a method in, uh, invocation and the subroutine encapsulates a set of steps, like another sequence of uh, instructions to be executed. But we treat that subroutine as a single unit, usually subject to some parameters, actual parameters that are sent to the formal parameters to actually execute that piece of the code. And in the case of procedural abstraction, we also change the context of the variables, usually to another frame or activation record on the stack. Recursion is actually a methodology to implement problems implemented with procedural abstraction. So an expression in the case of recursion is defined usually in terms of simpler versions of itself or indirectly, basically, by defining a base case. So the computational model in that case, in many cases, would require a stack which uh, will basically save the information about the partially evaluated instances of the expression for the previous calls. In, in fact, many languages also reduce the number of depth of the recursion, like we discovered in Python when we implemented the second homework for this class. Concurrency. Uh, concurrency, again, it's a control flow mechanism where two or more fragments of code are executed at the same time, either in parallel or interleaved on a single processor in a way that achieves the same effect. So there are many different concurrency mechanisms that we are aware of. Uh, coroutines, for instance, is uh, one. Uh, but today, most of the concurrency mechanisms that are used are using multi-threading or distributed programming. Exception handling and speculation. So in the case of exceptions, if an exception is encountered, usually the program is stopped and we branch to a handler to execute in place of the remaining piece of the code, which is called protected fragment, or in place of the entire fragment or in the case of speculation. So for speculation, the language implementation must roll back any visible effect of the protected code. Now, many languages, like for instance C, disallows speculation, but exception handling is very common in all programming languages. Basically, once an exceptional case or an exception is encountered, the program stops and it now jumps to the handler, wherever that catch statement may be in your program. Some programming languages, in fact, do not stop the execution or they stop the execution, but they don't skip any piece of the code. It just executes the handler and then it, they will return back to execute the rest of the program. We covered in previous courses like CSE 114 and other courses, try-catch mechanisms in Java. Uh, there are other mechanisms, but try-catch are most common, maybe 90 to 100 percent of the uh, exception handling is done through try-catch mechanisms. Non-determinacy, where the based on a choice, 
uh, it, we basically can execute uh, different statements. We have an unspecified, uh, basically, set of statements that can be executed next. And rule selection in logic programming is such a case. Basically, the programming language may choose any of the rules to prove uh, the correctness of statements. And in fact, in logic, there is absolutely no order of the rules. You are given a set of rules and uh, logical formulas and you have to prove what can be inferred from that set of logical formulas so when you choose rules to actually prove some logical statement it doesn't really matter which rules you are choosing next or it matters for efficiency reasons but not for correctness reasons we are going to talk more about non-determinacy in logic programming uh, many languages in logic programming apply non-determinacy for instance, one example would be Parlog. It's a parallel implementation of logic programming based on Prolog. So sequencing is important for imperative languages based on von Neumann architecture. Some of them may be object oriented, but they are all executing as basically a machine with certain steps. You are sequencing the instructions. Other programming languages like logic programming and functional logic uh, functional programming makes every use of recursion, non-determinacy, backtracking in the case of logic programming, and we are going to talk about backtracking in detail in logic programming. You get it for free, and in fact, the program will backtrack any time that it basically needs to collect new results. So we'll talk about logic programming in Prolog using backtracking as a control flow mechanism, which incrementally builds candidates to the solutions and abandons a candidate as soon as it determines that the candidate cannot possibly be completed to a valid solution. And as a simple example, think of a reachability program. A reachability that, given a graph, it finds the paths from one node to another node in the graph. So in logic programming, you write the reachability as two logical formulas. You can reach from some node X and node Y if there is an edge from x to y, or you can reach from x y if there is an edge from x to z, and you can reach from z y. But what if the program actually in the execution uh, wanders on an incorrect path? The moment that it reaches, for instance, a bad uh, node, it backtracks and finds another path to the correct node. Okay, and I can show you an example. We are going to cover it, in fact, for the final exam uh, later this semester. So let's say that there are there is a graph where we, there are edges from 1 to 2. Maybe there is another edge from 1 to 3. Another edge from 1 to 4. Maybe from 3 to 4. And then there is the reachability relation. So we can reach from a node X, a node Y, if there is an edge from X to Y. And similarly, we can reach from X, Y, if there is an edge from X to Z, and there is an edge from Z to Y. So now, what if the question that we want to ask is, can we reach from 1, 4? So first, it will try the base rules. Yes, we could reach from 1 to 4 if there is an edge from 1 to 4, but there is no such edge. So it backtracks and finds another rule and tries to actually find that path. So it will ask, is there an edge from 1 to some node? and it will try from 1 to 2, and then it will ask, can we reach from 2, 4, and that will fail, there is no rule to prove that, and then it will backtrack again, and you will find that we can, there is an edge from 1 to 3, and we can reach from 3, 4. So for this question, in fact, it will backtrack twice, and I will show it to you in Prolog, which we'll cover anyway for the exam let's save it on the black on the uh, desktop let's save it as test.pl and now we can run
You can either run XSV Prolog or you can run SWR Prolog based on what programming language you have installed on your machine. So for Prolog, the first thing that you have to do is to load that program and we are going to load it. So now we loaded it and we can trace the program to actually see the backtracking mechanism. So now we can ask our question, can we reach from 1, 4? And the program will start top down to find that path from 1 to 4. And it will tell us, yes, I can reach from 1, 4 if there is an edge from 1 to 4, which is in fact the first rule that we saw uh, in the, here, the first rule. And of course that will fail, so it will try to reach again from 1 to 4 in another way. So it will say, yes, if I can reach some node z, but that z has an internal representation, underscore, and some variable number, and it will find 2, and then it will try to find, to reach from 2, 4, which fails on both possible paths, and then it will backtrack again, and we'll try to redo, is there another edge from 1, and that is from 1 to 3, and 3 can reach 4, and we prove the reachability, and we are done. So, basically, backtracks, backtracking is a mechanism that is used a lot in logic programming, okay? And we are going to talk about that uh, uh, next, uh, next week, at the end of next week. So let's talk about first type of statements that we have in programming languages, and those are expressions. So an expression is a statement that always produces a value. For instance, an expression could be simple things like a literal, a variable, or a, 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 a value like a number, or a string. Or it could be a, a function or an expression applied to other expressions like for instance operators. Operators can be taught as building functions that take the operands and basically return a value. Usually they are use a special syntax like infix notation and we are going to talk about the different type of notations, infix, prefix, postfix notations. An expression could be a function call that takes a variable number of arguments. Operands are the arguments of an operator. So, when we talk about expressions, the first thing that we actually also have to implement in, in our homework 4 and 5 is the order of operands and operators in the expression. And there are infix operators most uh, often, they are the, where the, basically the oper, uh, operator occurs between or among the operands, and this is the common notation. Prefix operators, you can think of the uh, unary minus operator or the Polish notation. Polish notation used in most functional programming languages is where we have the operator first and then the arguments. And postfix operators, also called the reverse Polish uh, notation where the arguments occur before the operator itself. Most imperative languages use the infix notation, which actually has higher ambiguity than the other, the, the other notations in other languages. Uh, internally, they may use the prefix operations uh, for uh, notation for some operators, like for instance for uh, unary operators. Lisp in, uh, especially uses the prefix notation for all functions. Because in Lisp, everything is really a function. So, for instance, we write in any programming language a pand of a and b. In Lisp, we would write it as an expression where we put the parentheses between, before the append and we have a pand of a and b. But we do exactly the same also for expressions like multiplication, uh, summation, and so on. So this is the product between the result of the sum of 1 and 3 and 2. Prolog, for instance, is a mix. Basically, you can use the infix notation in the UI, and you can also use the uh, prefix notation in the UI, like a function call. Uh, internally, uh, the notation is actually always like a function call or like a predicate call. So, in fact, it will ask, is it true that x 
is equal, is unified with the sum of 1 plus 2. So what exactly is this precedence and associativity? Associativity is also how do we group? We group to the left or we group to the right uh, operators of equal uh, precedence. So let's take an example. We'll start, I added to the lecture notes uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday a lot of examples which are now updated on the course webpage. And here we start with an example. Consider that we have two operators star and circle and star is the of the highest precedence and is right associative that means that it groups to the right and circle is the lowest precedence and is left associative so now if we have an expression like the one uh, below that does not have any grouping parentheses in that case we have to take into consideration the highest precedence operators first and also the associativity to group them so first thing, we have to find the correct grouping. So in the case that we had the highest precedence was the star, it basically means that we have 1 star 2 is the highest precedence. It groups before the circle. Then we have 3 star 4 star four, uh, 5, which using right associativity will group into 3 star the result of 4 star 5. So it groups to the right hand side. The operators of the same precedence and then 7 star 8 star 9 is again grouped to the right so it's 7 star the result of 8 star 9 now we are left with expressions that are basically connected with the circle operator and circle is left associative that basically means that we start grouping from the left hand side so we have the first expression circle the second expression the result of that, which is within the curly braces, circle the, 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 sixth the six, the next expression, and the result of that, circle seven star, eight star nine, the last expression. So now if we build the syntax tree for this expression, we eliminate the parentheses, we don't care about the parentheses, the most, the highest, uh, the root operator is in fact this circle. So it's circle of Let's do the right hand side first, star of star, uh, 7 and star of 8, 9. And on the other branch, we have circle of 6 with circle of star 1, 2 and star 3, star 4, 5. So we build a syntax tree. Now we can obtain the prefix form and the postfix form of this uh, tree by actually reading the tree in pre-order for the prefix form and post order for the postfix form. So if we would write that expression, the first one that occurred with the precedence and uh, priority uh, uh, and associativity, it would be in prefix form circle, 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 star, one, two, star, three, star, four, five, star, seven, star, eight, nine. So we read it in prefix form where we uh, read the parent before we read the left child completely and then the right child completely. And we apply it for every node in the tree. So this is very important that it basically defines the meaning of that expression. And in fact, it also helps us to actually evaluate that expression to the correct value. In postfix form, the notation again, you read the children completely before you ch read the operator between those children. So we don't read the circle, we don't read the next circle, we continue down until we reach leaves. And in this case we read 1, 2, star, then 3, 4, 5, star, star, circle, then 6, circle, 7, 8, 9, star, star, and the circle root is the last one. It basically applies to the two arguments that are the left tree, the left tree and the right tree. So it's very important that the syntax tree is exactly in the order of operations that we have here. Although when I read it, I basically explained it the right tree before the left tree. But when we build it, it has to represent exactly what the expression is in the order of the expression, where the left and the right are matter. I think of division, for instance. Uh, it matters who is the, uh, what is the, uh, the two operands of the division, which is the denominator, for instance. 
so let's take for instance a standard arithmetical precedence and associative digit chart. So usually we are given uh, the PEMDAS uh, order. Parentheses have the highest priority. The head or the power operator is ma in many languages right associative and has higher priority than star and division. And true transitivity also has higher priority than plus and minus. Star and uh, or multiplication and division have equal priority again and are left associative and have higher priority than plus and minus. Plus and minus have equal priority, so when we do left associativity, we group them together. So again, we are given an expression like the one below, A multiplied with B to the power C to the power D, plus E minus F divided by G divided by H. First thing that we need to do is to find the correct grouping. So again, the power has the highest precedence, we basically have to execute it first. So we do right associativity for power because power was right associative in many languages is right associative together with the assignment operator that's also right associative in many languages we'll see it in a couple of seconds so first we have c to the power d and that's the power of b then we uh, have multiplication and division as highest priority so we have a multiply with that power and since we have left associativity for division, we have F divided by G and everything divided by H. And then we have left associativity for addition and subtraction, which have high, uh, equal priority. So first we have the summation of this expression, the multiplication expression and E, and then everything minus the, sec the, the last expression. Then we draw again the syntax tree, in which case the main operator, the root operator, is minus and is minus between the sum of multiplication of A and the power of B and power of CD and summation with E and division between division of F and G and H. So now we, when we read it in prefix form, we read it in pre-order from the tree. So it's plus minus multiplication A of power B power C D. We return back to E. Then we have division division F G H. So again, we basically read in pre-order means read the parent operator first and then the children left child followed by right child completely. So we basically, the, oper the first operator applies to two expressions. First expression is the summation, and the second one is the division. And then internally, we do exactly the same process. We covered in CSE 214 data structures and algorithms, basically trees, and how to read in pre order and post order a tree. In postfix form, we do exactly the opposite. We read first completely the left child and then the right child and then the operator. And we apply it at every node. So for at the beginning, we basically have to read the left child, then we have to read the left child of that. And then the first uh, thing that we actually write is A. A, B, C, D, power, power, multiplication. E, summation, which read completely the left tree. Then we go to the right tree and we have FG division, H division, minus. So minus apply to the, applies to the previous two operands, which is the division and the summation. So now let's talk about the theoretical premises. So basically when we write in infix notation without parentheses, the operators may lead to ambiguity as what is the operand of what. So, for instance, when we have an expression like this one, that is similar to what we discussed before, like A plus B multiplied with C power D power E divided by F, uh, we actually have to decide how do we, what's the priority of operators and what operators apply to what operands. So, the answer is expect, that we expect in standard arithmetics 
is that the power is executed first has the highest priority and power is right associative in many languages and in fact in mathematics also so it will be c to the power d to the power e then we have multiplication and division are higher priority than addition so we have and this left associative so we have b multiplied with this expression everything divided by f and then we have a plus the the right expression so it's neither the two that we have below or many others basically we know exactly what is the meaning of an expression based on the precedence so the precedence rules specify that certain operator is in absence of parentheses group more tightly than other operators for instance multiplication and division group more tightly than addition and subtraction and we are if we are given in elementary school 2 plus 3 multiply with 4 we know that we execute the multiplication first and then the summation so that it will be 14 and it's not that we execute the summation first followed by the multi multiplication which would give us 20. so know exactly the fact that multiplication has higher precedence than uh, addition we will see in fact that even early programming languages like pascal the end operator uh, had actually higher precedence than uh, less than operator so for instance an expression that in many languages we would consider to be a correct expression like one less than two and three less than four is actually a static compilation error in pascal and mainly the reason for that was that n was overloaded it meant both conjunction in logic in as boolean expression and it meant a uh, bitwise conjunction so we see here that the priority chart for pascal and how it was actually fixed for c in c that it actually doesn't uh, uh, have a problem so the operators at the top of the group would group more tightly so in the case of and and has higher priority than less than operator so it would group for instance for the previous case 2 and 3 and it will give us a, uh, an integer because it would be like bitwise conjunction and it will give us a number and now we would have an expression that has no meaning uh, it's basically one less than an integer less than four which basically would not apply because the first one would return a boolean and now we would compare a boolean with four but this was fixed in many basically languages so to return back again what is precedence it's something that you learned and all of us learned usually in elementary school uh, and we learned it with acronyms like for instance the fact that parentheses has the highest priority we execute stuff in parentheses first then exponents then multiplication and division they have equal uh, priority and again it depends on associativity another notion of what executes first and then we have addition and subtraction and we learned it in uh, uh, elementary school as PEMDAS which in order to remember this acronym we usually uh, uh, give it a funny meaning like please excuse my dear aunt Sally it actually means parentheses exponents multiplication division addition subtraction in Canada for instance the same acronym is bed bed mess it means brackets exponents division multiplication multiplication addition subtraction in other countries means uh, it's a different uh, acronym like bomb desk both mass and so on associativity rules specify whether sequence of operators and equal press uh, uh, of equal precedence group to the right or group to the left so for instance many operators are left associative so that basically means that an expression like 9 minus 3 minus 2 groups to the left so the meaning of this is is 9 minus 3 the result of that minus 2 which would give us 9 minus 3 minus 2 which would give us 4 is 6 minus 2 and not 8 if if we would group the right hand side first it would be 9 minus 1 the result of 3 minus 2 which would give us 8 so in this case there is absolutely no uh, other uh, basically rule uh, because the two opera operators are the same there is no not one highest product uh, highest priority than the other we actually have to decide if we group to the left or to the right 
Okay. So the exponent operator, for instance, uh, would be right to left. In standard mathematics, we would have 4 to the power 3 to the power 2, which gives us this value, 262,144, and not 4 to the power 3 to the power 2, which would give us uh, 4,096. Most expressions are left associative, uh, and actually what I meant is most operators are left associative. However, there are a few that are right associative, and mainly the one that you may, might have seen in many programming languages is the assignment operator. So, for instance, when we have an assignment between variables x equal y equal z, the meaning of that is really that we assign the value of z to y, so we group to the right first, then the new value of y, which is now uh, the value of z, we assign it to x. So the associativity is really that x is assigned the result of y after it's assigned z. And of course there are more complicated examples than this that it's not that just one variable is assigned to the previous variables, but it may also be other examples like for instance one that would use let's say uh, other operators like x is incremented with the value of y which is decremented with the value of z where z was assigned the value of t plus 1. So again the meaning is that x will be incremented with the value of y after y is it's decremented with the value of z, after z is uh, assigned the value of t plus 1. So as you can see, we group to the right. We first execute the right assignment, then the next assignment, and so on, towards the left-hand side. And as I said earlier, in many languages, we also have that the power operator is also right associative. Now, in all of these cases, if we are confused about the order of operators, use parentheses. As we saw in the previous example, the precedence always says execute the stuff in the parentheses. So if you don't understand in certain cases what's the meaning of expressions, then put parentheses to make sure what is the semantics of that specific expression. So this is why when we actually implemented our homework, uh, which you are also you are currently doing, for every operator that we have, we had to we had to actually define the semantics of uh, th that operator using the associativity and the precedence. I saw that Blackboard is currently down. Uh, can you still hear me? Okay, so let's continue our lecture. It seems that you can hear me, it's just Blackboard that is currently not working. Okay, good. So the execution order is not necessarily defined. Like, for instance, let's consider also the following expression, 1 less than 2 and 3 greater than 4. Now, in many languages, the language definition actually uh, disallows reordering statements. But reordering statements gives us optimizations in many cases. Like, for instance, in this expression, 1 less than 2 is true, in which case for computing the true value of the conjunction, we would also have to compare 3 with 4, which gives us false. Now, in a language that would reorder these two statements, these two statements do not interact with each other, if we know that 3 greater than 4 is false, we don't have to execute 1 less than 2. So, in some languages, we have exact order, left to right, execute the instructions of the statements uh, left to right or top to bottom in a method. But some languages, if we are guaranteed not to change the meaning or the results of the program, we are allowed to reorder. 
In fact, in databases, query optimization is reordering. It's basically implementing selection before we actually uh, do joins, because if we filter out uh, results, then the, 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 uh, the join is much, much cheaper. We don't have to create all the possible tuples resulted from the Cartesian uh, uh, product of, of two sets or of tuples or re of relations. We actually can just compute that join for a uh, 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 reduced set of the input uh, statements. So there is actually a rule uh, in uh, query optimizations which reorders the, the order of operators that does pushes selections deeper to apply as early as possible. So it does as much selections or filtering as possible and then only for those tuples where let's say the the city is Stony Brook it will join it with some other tuples. It doesn't have to do it for all the cities in the United States. It basically if you are interested in what students are going to Stony Brook you would get it from a database of all the students let's say in the United States but you can actually filter the students as early as possible. So reordering increases speed. speed. And in most cases, we are exploiting some kind of math identities that set, sets are equivalent with other sets, even if we apply uh, filters. Now, reordering can also reduce precision, may have side effects, and we basically have to do it only when the result is guaranteed to be the same. So how exactly can we do reordering, for instance, is by finding in many cases the common sub-expression in the equation. So let's consider that we have two assignments, A is assigned B plus C, and D is assigned C plus E plus B. We can see that if we actually execute this and each operation would take uh, one step and assignment with one step or one cycle, then we have one summation followed by an assignment, that's two cycles, then one summation followed by another summation followed by an assignment, that's five statements in total. But if we know the value of A and we know that B plus E plus B is it's equivalent with B plus C plus E, then we can actually do optimize it to only four steps, like A is assigned B plus B and D is assigned A plus E. And similarly, we have here, if division is left associative, this statement can be translated into this statement, which is cheaper. We have only three operations followed by three assignments instead of four operations followed by two assignments. Again, it depends which operations take longer and which takes less. And in this case, we have a temporary value that we don't need to assign to anything. We just need to keep it in a register. So one assignment could be actually avoided. So we talked here about execution ordering. Most programming languages would actually take that execution ordering into account and will implement conjunction and disjunction in different ways. So in a conjunction, if we know that one operand is false, then we don't actually have to execute the second operand because the entire conjunction is false. In a disjunction, if we know that one operand is true, then the entire disjunction is true. So we don't have to execute the second operand. This is called in programming languages short circuiting. It basically means that if we know in a conjunction that the first operand is false, if A is greater than or equal with B, then there is no point in evaluating B less than C because A less than B and B less than C is automatically false. From the truth table of conjunction, if the first operand is false, the, sec the second one does not it could be true or false, but the conjunction itself is false. So we don't need to compute the second operation. So most operators in many programming languages, and in fact, in this case, I'm referring to most Boolean operators, are short circuit. However, some languages, like for instance in Java, you have a choice of two operators, one that is short circuiting and one that is unconditional. That means that that operator evaluates both expressions, no matter what. 
so for instance even if you have an expression like false and i post incremented with one is less than zero this is modifying this is actually false however it has a side effect i is incremented with one okay so short circuiting is actually useful in many programming languages like for instance we can use short circuiting not to, ex to have division by zero we only in the case that b is, di is different than zero we execute a divided by b if b is equal with zero this is false therefore we will basically know that the entire conjunction is false and we will never execute a division by b similar in a pointer uh, in a language that allows references if we know that a reference is not null and we basically if it would be null it would be false only then we would actually use that reference to extract the data field so in many programming languages the idea that we have shortcutting the shortcutting is very useful for guards basically when we execute when we want to avoid executing an expression that would generate an exception or which has no meaning in mathematics okay so before we continue with assignments up to now we talked about expressions in general precedence associativity and uh, short circuiting okay so let's see if there are any questions in the chat. I also want to make sure that you still hear me because we saw that Blackboard is down. So any questions about operators or expressions? And that includes priority of operators or precedence. Uh, associativity. short-circuit operators. Okay. So I added to the lecture notes in the last two days and uh, the updates are on the website. Uh, new examples, uh, the examples that we actually covered uh, uh, in the lectures. Usually I cover those through uh, quizzes in the class, but since this is an online class, uh, it's much easier to put it in the lecture notes. So you know exactly the examples that uh, may appear in the exam. And in fact, I already posted on Piazza a sample final. You, most of you, I think, got the email yesterday, which contains all the chapters that we covered up to now in class. So the sample that you will find on Blackboard uh, co basically contains questions from three, from four chapters. And the four chapters that we are going to cover in the final exam are control flow, data types. Actually, we started with semantic analysis. control flow data types and logic programming we may cover uh, in class uh, other topics like uh, subroutines and procedures uh, uh, a little bit of uh, object oriented but you already know all of the top the issues that may occur uh, from classes like uh, CSE 114, 214, 219 and so on. And a little bit of concurrency, which again was uh, a little bit covered in CSE 219. But we, we cover as much as we can in this semester. Okay. So you will see that the final sample contains questions from associativity that we discussed today, uh, compiling of short circuit uh, uh, expressions into machine language code or close to machine language architecture code. So again, we are going to talk about this in a couple of minutes. Then we'll talk about data types next class. And here are the examples how these are compiled into uh, machine language code or close to machine language. And finally, we have several questions from uh, prolog and 
that covers everything. We are going to cover that later this semester. Okay, so let's check one more time if Blackboard is back. It doesn't matter, in fact. So I believe it's not. But anyway, any questions? Can you still hear me? Okay, thank you. Just making sure. Okay, so let's continue with expression evaluations and we continue with assignments. So assignments in imperative languages consist of an order of ordered series of changes of the values in variables. So now if you think of a variable, if it occurs on the right hand side of a, an assignment, it means that we need to take the value of that variable, which is called the right value, R value of that variable. If it occurs on the left hand side uh, of an assignment, it really means that we have we need access to the location of that variable. So we need the reference to that variable in which a value should be placed. So in fact, when we talk about variables, depending on which side of an assignment they may occur, we evaluate those variables in a compiler to an L value if it occurs on the right hand side of the assignment or uh, uh, L value for the left hand side of the assignment or to the R value which is in fact the value uh, if it occurs on the right hand side of the assignment. And let's take two examples. For instance when we assign to the variable D the value of A. The meaning is that we take the right value of a, which is basically the value of a, and we assign it to, we put it in the location of the variable d, so the l value of d. Similarly, in an expression like the one below, we take the r value of b and the r value of c, we sum them up, and now we assign it to uh, the location, we put it in the location of a. So the left hand side, for instance, in this case, would refer to the location of A, where we want to put the sum of the values of B and C. So because of this ordering that we have the left hand side of an assignment, we call the variable as the location or the left side of the assignment, the L value. And when the expression or the variable occurs on the right hand side of an assignment, we refer it to uh, the right value, R value. So for instance, if the variable A contains 100 and the variable B contains 200, when we have an assignment A is assigned the value of B, A will be, so we actually have to build the syntax tree. The node representing A is really the left side, the location of A, the L value of A. The node that represents B should be uh, stating the fact that is the R value of B, is basically the value of B. So the value is actually placed into the location, the value of B is placed into the location of A. More difficult is for arrays, where you basically have, on the left hand side, you basically have an indexed variable. On the right hand side, you would have uh, uh, also an index variable, but you are not referring to the location of that element, you are referring to the value of that element. So for instance, let's assume that here we have also uh, the value of some array, like b of j. And here the same thing, you may have multidimensional arrays where let's say that this is b of i, j. So the meaning of a of i and b of j is different. a of i refers to the location of that element, b of j refers to the value of that element. Similarly for a of i, j and b of i, j. A of ij here for assignments, you have to assign to that location of an element in a multidimensional array the value of an, ex of an element on the, uh, uh, from a multidimensional array. Now again, in fact, you should also think about associativity of, of uh, indexing. 
So what actually is the meaning of B of I J? The associativity of bracket is really that bracket, open bracket or left bracket ha is uh, left associative because it first applies to its B of I gives us the row in that matrix and now that applied to J gives us the element in in that matrix, in that row. So think a little bit also what's actually the meaning. It basically means B of I and that will give us a row and then we have uh, of J. So in fact the indexing is a left associative operator. Okay. Now it also we should consider when we have some operation like B of IJ plus something else, uh, maybe just value one. The bracket has higher priority than the addition. In fact, it may be the other way. We have one plus B of I uh, and J. Again, we don't actually sum the row with one. We sum the result of extracting the element at index uh, row number I and column number J with one. So uh, we, we may either use indexing as a separate factor, uh, non-terminal in the grammar, or we may actually put it together with addition and other operators, but in that case we have to specify that uh, indexing has higher priority than any other operator that we have in the language. Okay? You are probably at that point to uh, implement arrays or lists in your homework, so I thought that it would be useful for me to describe it now, if you have any questions. Okay, any questions? Okay, cool. It will not be a problem in homework 4, but it will be a problem in homework 5, where you have to actually implement assignment and you have to consider if a variable or an indexed variable occurs on the left hand side or on the right hand side of, uh, of an assignment. And similarly you have to implement the associativity in the homework 4 for an array, the associativity and the precedence of operators. Okay, so this is just a note that may help you in your homework. Okay, let's see if there are any questions. No. So let's continue. Also, uh, next class, when we talk about data types, we actually are going to talk about how variables are stored in memory and what's the meaning of variables. So, in fact, most programming languages make uh, two different models for variables. The value model, where the variable is an alias for a location of memory in which the value is stored directly, like for instance for primitive type uh, variables in Java, uh, the variable itself is just gives us that location, it's an alias for a location which stores the value. And the reference model, where the variable is actually an alias to a location in memory that contains an address where the value is actually stored on the heap or somewhere else in memory, like even in the global segment of uh, memory. So the value semantics versus the reference semantics, uh, variables may refer to directly to values or variables may refer to objects. And in that case, refer really means that we have a pointer stored in the variable that actually refers to that object. Java has both. The built-in types are values in variables, like for instance primitive type variables, and the user-defined types are objects and variables are references. They are called reference type variables. When the variable appears in a context that expects an R value, 
it must be dereferenced internally to obtain the value to which it refers. And in most the languages, this dereference is implicit and automatic, like in Java. Again, it depends also on the operator, because some operator require the, the actual address. Uh, in other languages, you have a uh, pointer arithmetic to actually iterate through the elements of an, of an array, of a list. Now, talking about value model versus reference model, there is also an issue of when you build uh, generic data types, like for instance hash tables or stacks, uh, what is the type of the elements? So usually in generic data structures you, you use some super class of all classes in that language to uh, expect what is the expected element of that uh, data type. So for instance, version, earlier versions of Java, like Java 1.2, uh, the programmer was required to wrap the building type uh, into an object so they can use hash tables or any kind of generic data structures. So the wrapper classes were invented in Java 5 and they were needed because hash table expects as a parameter a class derived from object, not a primitive type like an int. And an int is not an object in Java. Recent versions of Java since Java 5 perform the boxing of primitive types into uh, objects automatically and unboxing when you actually need a primitive type like a sum of integers but the object, the operand is actually an object. So here we have an example. We can put directly into a hash table uh, at key 13, the value 31. And when we want to assign it to an integer m, we can directly get that object. And in this example, we assume that this is a standard hash table, not parameterized to integer type. So uh, we have to cast the result of get to integer, and then we can assign that integer to an int because it does automatic unboxing, which returns an int when it's needed. Okay, so this actually is a, it's a problem of evaluating expressions, but we will talk about them more in detail next class when we talk about data types. Now we have to it uh, to. Uh, go from expressions to statements. So in some languages, expressions and statements are the same. Basically, an expression uh, may also be used as a statement, and other statements always are evaluated to values. And for instance, the best example is functional languages. Everything that you write in a functional language is an expression that gets evaluated. Even when you declare a function, it returns back, this is a function from the domain, this domain to this codomain, this range. In logic programming, for instance, everything is evaluated to a Boolean value. So you write every predicate, you write rules, they are true, false, undefined in some languages. Like for instance, prolog, by default in ISO prolog you have true and false, everything is either true or false. However, uh, some programming languages like the Stony Brook XSB prolog uh, SB stands for Stony Brook, uh, has three true values, true, false, and undefined or unknown. Like for instance, in our program that we wrote earlier in reachability, what if I'm asking some query about some predicate P that was never defined? I should not be given that P is false, I should be actually given the fact that uh, this is not known. Uh, most generally, it happens when you have some kind of uh, uh, issues in the program. Like, for instance, let's assume that we have a predicate A, and A is true if B is false. And let's say that we have B is true if A is false. In fact, even simpler than that, what if we have a rule that says P is true if B is false? And the opposite, P is false if P is true. So this program basically has no model, because if P would be true, then it must be false. If P is false, then it must be true. So this would be like the Barber paradox that 
you cannot prove neither that P is true or false. So P has to be a middle value that is neither true nor false at the same time. Okay. The previous one in answer set programming, a logic programming paradigm, has two models. One in which A is true and B is false, and one in which A is false and B is true. So you can basically, if you ask a question, is A true, it will tell you that is, it could be both true and false at the same time, which is uh, basically inconsistent in standard uh, first order logic, more mathematical logic. So the, the, the point here is that expressions return a value, either that they return a function or a value or a true value and so on. But in some languages, we have pure statements. And you can think of, for instance, a print statement. A print statement does not return anything. It prints something to the uh, output. So some statements do not return anything. You can think of loop statements. They are executing and then you exit the loop. Most languages, starting with C, are halfway in between. That means that some val statements return values, but some do not. It would allow expressions to appear instead of statements and vice versa. For instance, we here we have an assignment to A and then the value of A is considered as a Boolean value. C lacks a separate Boolean type, so it accepts an integer where zero means false and any other type is true. Other languages like Java makes a clear separation between Booleans and numbers. You cannot basically use a number when you need a boolean, you cannot use a boolean when you need a number. Now, continuing about assignments, there are more issues about assignments. In fact, there are many operators for assignments. There are the pre-increment, post-increment operators, there are the increment with value, decrement with value operators, and so on. So, how about combining assignments? For instance, a is equal with a plus 1 has an effect to increment the value of a. However, if functions also have side effects, there are methods in some language that have side effects. An expression like the following one is not really safe, because if the function has some side effect in changing, let's say, the value of the, the indexed variable at uh, index uh, i, then a of function of i assigned a of function of i, a of function of i may have a different meaning the second time that it evaluates. So it's safer to evaluate first the result of the function and then increment a of j with 1. Or even just uh, incrementing a of applying the function once with 1 with the plus plus operator. So there are many assignment operators plus plus, plus equal, minus equal, minus minus. They are handy, they avoid redundant work, or they may be needed for optimization. And they, like in this case, we also have optimization that we ex executed this only once, similarly here. But they may have side effects and they would be performed more than once. So for instance, plus plus in Java and C, they may occur in prefix or postfix form, in which case we know that we may have different values. Uh, if you want to see more examples uh, of plus plus and minus minus, you can take a look at my lecture notes for Computer Science 1, CSE 114, where we have a lot of examples of how these are executed in Java. In all of these cases, the assignment also returns values. So basically, you can use the new value or the old value of the variable into an expression. And of course, that's where you have to make sure that you understand the semantics of the operator and how it's executed internally. So this is exactly the topic of the class today. We did it in Java earlier uh, in our degrees, I guess. OK, so what exactly are side effects? We said that functions may have side effects or operators may have side effects like plus plus, beside the fact that it returns the value of i or of the variable, it also increments i with 1. A side effect is some kind of a, a permanent state change caused by the execution of the function or the operator. And basically, you have some noticeable effect of 
the call other than the return value. It increments the value of i or you call the method but it also modifies some global value. In the most general sense, it basically changes the value of a variable somewhere in memory, which is exactly what any assignment statement would do. So they change the value of a variable. And this is good, don't get me wrong, it actually is good for uh, methods which uh, w for cases where we basically uh, rely like in imperative programming only on side effects. So side effects are fundamental to the von Neumann model of computing where we execute a sequence of statements and we modify the memory in each of the statements. In some languages like in functional and logic programming and data flow languages and query languages there are no such changes. Basically in a statement when we assign or we match x with 1, the meaning is that x is 1 and nothing else. These are called single assignment statements. In logic you cannot basically say that x is equal with 1 and x is equal with 2 at the same time. So in several languages the side effects for functions, the side effects for multiple assignments are disallowed. It allows to prove things about the programs like, for instance, you can do reordering, you can know exactly what's the meaning of that function, it returns a value and nothing else. It's closer to the mathematical induction, it's easier to optimize because you can now reorder statements or method invocations without having to think of the fact that they may actually modify some global value and there is a race to, uh, to actually uh, that variable and multiple methods rely on that variable to execute the program. It's often easier to understand. So there are two things that you have to take away from this slide. Basically the fact that in languages like uh, logic programming and functional programming you cannot assign to a variable multiple values. And I will show it to you in Prolog. So in this example in Prolog that we did earlier, let's say that we do not want to trace anymore so we stop the debugging and now we write x is matched to 1 and x is matched to 2. So the meaning going logic of this is that x is 1 and x is 2 at the same time. And that's not possible. You cannot change the value of x once you basically assigned to x a value. So Basically, this is the meaning of single assignment uh, languages. It means that you, once you assign a value to a variable, it's basically a conjunction. You should interpret the expression as a conjunction. And in a conjunction, what you are saying is, is it true that x is 1 and 2 at the same time? Which is not true. But this is really like we are matching. If we say x is 1, it means that x is 1. From now on, we can actually print the value of x and it will print 1. Okay? So, it basically, it, it is like assignment, but it's called single assignment because we cannot assign two values. Uh, it's not like we can assign 1 to x and then we can assign 2 to x and print the new value of x afterwards. This will actually print only one because it executes up to here, but now when it, want, it wants to assign x to 2, it will say, no, I cannot, because x was 1, and this is a conjunction. This says, is it true that x is 1 and x is 2? No, that cannot be the case. You cannot have one variable equal with two different values. Okay? So... This is what single assignment operators mean, or single assignment variables mean, and it's exactly the same for functional languages. You cannot say that x is 1 and 2 at the same time in a function. Several languages will basically disallow side effects in functions altogether. You cannot actually have side effects in functions. Everything has to be done through functions and recursion. And you can think of functional programming or ML that we cover earlier this semester, everything had to be done through recursion. You cannot use global variables to assign values, to modify values in the global me memory. 
that's not totally true for instance in prolog you have asserts which allows you to actually modify values in memory or delete values from memory and so on okay so any questions yes of course please post a link on piazza i think the the uh, SB Connect is already posted on Piazza. Let's let's actually make sure that that is the case because I know that Blackboard is currently down. Does anyone have the link to SB Connect? Thank you. Good. So let's post this on Piazza, make sure that everybody can join the class. Good. Thank you very much. That's a great idea. Next, there are multi-way assignments. For instance, in ML, Perl, Python, Ruby, we have A, B, which is a tuple, is assigned C, D, which is another tuple. So now the tuple on the left hand side is evaluated to a tuple of L values, locations, and the tuple on the right hand side is assigned, it's evaluated to a tuple of values, R values. So the effect is that each argument like C is assigned to A, B is assigned to B, uh, D is assigned to B. Moreover, you can actually have swap of two variables in one single line without having to create a temporary variable. So, for instance, the way that we were swapping, let's say, for sorting uh, in some language like uh, Java variables would be that we take the original value, let's say that A is 100, B is 200, and then we would create a temporary variable to store the value of a then we would uh, assign to a the value of b then we would assign to b the value of the temporary variable and now if we would evaluate a and b they have the value swap but in languages that allow tuples or multi-way assignments we can do everything in one single statement like for instance we can assign to a and b the values of b and a in one single line and now in a is 100 in b is 200 okay so the comma has basically the effect of producing a tuple of l values while the comma operator in the right hand side produces a tuple of l value, uh, r values so it will allow us to actually swap things that will take us additional memory and additional uh, uh, time to allocate that memory. So multi-way assignment is also useful for returning multiple values from a function. And we actually did an example like this in SML. If you remember, we computed mean and max at the same time. It's very easy to compute mean max at the same time by basically returning both mean and max from the function call. So foo in this case is a method that takes uh, some arguments, actual parameters, applies those, uh, returns a value, uh, a set of values, basically uh, multiple values, returns a tuple of A, B, and C. So Java, for instance, would require us to actually compute, uh, to create a, a class with multiple data fields and return an object of that class. In Python, we can do it in one single line by just using tuples. Tuple is a, a type that does not exist in Java. 
definite assignments. For instance, when we started programming at the beginning of your computer science uh, courses, you noticed a fact in Java, for instance, that on all possible execution paths to a method, through a method, if you are returning uh, some value from that method, you must have a return value on every execution path. Similarly, if you have variables and you are using them in expressions, they must be assigned a value on all the possible execution paths. So the fact that variables that are used as R values, as values in assignments, are initialized uh, can be statically checked by the compiler. Every single con con possible control path to the expression must assign a value to every variable in that expression. So let's consider the following case, that we have i defined, j defined and equal with 3, and if j is greater than 0, i is assigned 2. The compiler does not execute statements, so it only sees that there is a logical condition, and if that is true, it assigns uh, 2 to i, but otherwise there is no assignment statement that assigns some value to i. So when we want to print the value of i, it doesn't matter that we have the same logical statement or that this is basically at the same level with declaring i, we will get an error that i was not initialized on the execution, on some execution path. So which basically means that we have to have rules, static rules, that checks that on all the possible execution paths we have an assignment to the variables that are used as R values in some uh, expression in the program. These are hard to do it, uh, especially statically with semantic rules, but most languages do it. For instance, Java. We actually saw it in many cases in Java we say that on all possible execution paths we must have assigned a value before we use that variable. And similarly, we must have a return statement from a method that uh, doesn't return void, returns some value on all possible execution paths. We'll talk more about that when we talk about subroutines. Okay, so we actually talked about expressions. Now we can talk about statements. So when we talk about statements, especially when we talk about control uh, selection statements or basically conditional statements, we have to talk about two types of programming, structured programming and unstructured programming. So first, what is structured programming? It's higher level programming where you basically have every statement has a clear meaning you don't have unconditional jumps in your program that when you reach this line, you jump to this label with maybe anywhere in the memory. Basically, structure programming was invented to give a more mathematical, clear meaning to programs so that, so that developers understand the program in an easier way. Uh, for instance, all the control flow that we talked up to now is structured. Basically, we have sequencing, we have if statements, we have while loops that execute structurally, basically execute while the condition is true or until the condition is true or false. So, we, structured programming is when we define a program by making use of subroutines, block structures, loops like for loops and while loops in contrast of actually writing statements sequentially and having go-to statements that could lead to very complicated, difficult to understand code, hard to follow and maintain. In fact, there was a very old article basically telling us that unstructured programming is bad and we should always write structured programming. So we will talk first about what does it mean unstructured flow. So in the original assembly languages, any control flow was achieved by means of jumps. Unconditional jumps like go to statements, like for instance in this case, print hello, then the next statement go back to 10. And this will basically run forever. Dijkstra wrote a very useful uh, uh, article in the ACM Communications, 1972. He got Turing Award for his uh, uh, contributions to algorithms. And he basically 
his point was go to should be always considered harmful. It's very hard to limit the go to statement to nested scopes. Uh, it has very hard to predict behavior. So we have to limit the behavior of the go to statements. It's impossible to analyze also the behavior of the program with go to statements because it may be a go to to a value that is computed, a label that is computed in the program. So how can you limit, uh, like for instance, in the case of a conditional uh, uh, go to statement, where do you jump next? And what's the meaning of the program? Most modern programming languages hardly allow it. So this is what unstructured programming means. It's basically when you have jumps in your program, either conditional or unconditional. Conditional means, unconditional means go to, conditional means where you have some kind of conditional jump based on a condition. So again, lower level assembly languages allowed jumps. And these jumps, unstructured jumps, could be unconditional, which basically means based on some logical condition, we jump to some uh, location, some label in memory. And most programming languages have these conditional jumps. Basically, jump if zero, jump if the operator one, if zero to some location, jump if the operator is not zero, jump if two operators are equal jump if two operators are different, jump if one operator is greater than another one, jump if some operator is not greater than another one, jump if an operator is greater than equal with another one, jump if an operator is not greater than equal with another one, jump if an operator is less than another one, operand is less than another one, jump if is not less, jump if is less than equal, and jump if is not less than equal. Most of these statements in assembly or in some machine language basically will take the operands in two registers, like register one and register two, and the address where it jumps. If they are unary jumps, like jump if zero or jump if not zero, will take a register, like register four, let's say, and an address where to jump if that operator, that register contains a zero or a non-zero value. Then we have structured programming. Structured programming is top-down design. We basically implement methods. We use clear statements like if statements, which we know exactly what gets executed next, either the then clause or the else clause, and then the, re the next statement after the if statement. We write imperative algorithms elegantly using sequencing, selection, iteration, or recursion, and nothing else. There are no jumps, conditional or unconditional. It still includes some alternatives to go to statements, but with a clearly defined scope, like for instance, return statements. They jump back to the parent method or the caller method, but uh, we know exactly. We return to the return address for uh, this uh, uh, current frame in, in for the current state uh, for the current method. So we change. We know exactly the meaning. We change the program counter. We change the stack pointer, the frame pointer to the previous frame in the stack. Continue and break. Continue jumps to the end of the current loop, the current block. Uh, break does exactly the same. Jump to the end of the block if it's in a, a switch statement, if it's in a, a block, uh, uh, if it's in a loop block. It, it basically finishes executing the block and continues the next statement after the block. So they are alternatives to jumps, but they are not really uh, go-to statements. We cannot jump anywhere uh, beside the fact where you basically jump by default. Exceptions are also kind of go-to to the handler for this exception. But again, it's not an explicit jump. It's actually a very well-defined jump. You continue the execution from a certain line in the code, from a certain part in the code. Continuations, we'll see them later in Ruby and Scheme. They've wrapped the current scope into uh, an object and then 
basically calling object will restore the scope and the location and the set of variables available at that point. And I have an example of a continuation in scheme. We define a test, uh, the continuation, as uh, basically a piece of code where we define the variable i equal with zero. And at each time we basically continue the, it, the continuation, we increment i with one. So when we start test, the value of i is, z is zero, but we actually add one to it. So the value of i is one. Every time we call the continuation, it becomes 2 and 3. Then we define another continuation that assigns the scope of the current continuation. So when we reset the continuation and we have 1, we continue with the continuation is 2. And now if we call another continuation, it will continue with the scope of the previous iteration, which increments from 3 to 4. So the point being that we have some kind of jumps, but these jumps are really not uh, uh, jumps. They, they are jumps, but they are not explicit jumps. We don't explicitly say where to jump. We actually uh, uh, jump very controlled in a controlled manner, manner. So it's structured programming. We know exactly what happens next. We can analyze the program. We can understand the program in an easier way than just follow the the execution flow during runtime. So let's talk about structured programming and basically in detail what exactly it means. Earlier at the beginning of the class we just enumerated sequencing, selection, loops, iteration and so on. So sequencing means that the statements are executing in order, top to bottom. Some statements may, some languages may waive this for optimization, like for instance, if we have two assignments to A and B uh, to, of two functions and those functions are guaranteed not to interact with each other, we can actually execute them in any order, even concurrently. So uh, foo and bar do not have side effects. Basically, we can execute B first uh, or assign B first and then A. Uh, however, sequencing is defined usually formally as the order of, uh, of the statements in the program, and if we do optimizations, we have to do them in a safe way. Selection can be of multiple types. If statements, if statements with an else branch, uh, if statements which basically on the else branch may have also another if statement, so if, else, if, else don't require nesting. They basically keep terminators from piling up at the end with end, 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 and so on. We saw it in uh, other languages uh, earlier uh, this semester. Switch statements, where we basically do a hash function on the, op on the value in the switch, and then we can use an array or a hash table to look where to go next can be more efficient than executing a lot of if statements, a cascade of if, else, if, else, if, else, and so on, which basically would do the, ex the operation of the comparison multiple times. It's similar to short circuiting. Basically, it will basically uh, compare once with all of the operators. And in each one of the branches, we may have a break that basically stops the current block and uh, continues the rest of the code. So here we have another example, if foo or bar, and now we can talk about short circuit when we have if statements. So what is short circuit? Short circuit is that when we know that one operand is true or false, depending on the operator, we can avoid calling the other operand. So in the case of a disjunction, if we know that the first operand is true, we don't need to execute bar, the second operand. Now, before we understand how these are getting compiled into a machine level code, we have to understand what exactly is the machine level code. Like we do programming, structure programming, but this program gets executed on a machine level code that may have jumps, uh, but mainly it has very simple instructions. And these instructions are usually reduced 
and there is a reduced set of instructions like in higher level languages we have a lot of languages like python ruby perl uh, java c and so on but at machine level we have a very reduced set of instructions uh, 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 and languages we have intel that produces processors machine level architectures we have arm uh, we have amd and so on there are not many there are a very few set of instructions and these are called the ter target machine architecture so a compiler is simply a translator it translates from a higher level language into another in many cases a lower level language a machine level language the second language can be almost anything some other higher level language like for instance from c++ to c or photo setting commands for a type set for a, for a printer uh, vlsi basically the layout of the circuit in the case of vlsi uh, languages for declaring uh, basically uh, the structure or the the, uh, uh, the the way that a circuit is implemented but most of the time in our case higher level languages uh, is a machine language for some available computer and just like in many different programming languages there are many different machine languages although the there is less di diversity than the higher level languages we may have 10 uh, some a, a dozen of machine level languages although we we all will interact in our lifetime with hundreds if not thousands of higher level languages each machine language corresponds to a different architecture even uh, with a different addressing scheme 32-bit versus 64-bit the size of an address uh, of a memory location in the language so now we can actually talk about how do we compile higher level structured code into machine language uh, so machine language is very low level it usually takes the operands of any instruction from registers and it has uh, it doesn't have if statements because if statements would contain internally some kind of uh, 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 it could basically the expression in the if statement can be very complicated but we can execute very simple if statements where the boolean expression is executed a comparison or we check that an, the operand the register is true or false and then we we execute some code only for that operand we jump basically to another to a location in memory so let's actually think about the following statement we have some statement in java that says if a is greater than b and c is greater than uh, c is greater than d or e is different than f then execute some then close else execute some else close and then continue the code so how do we execute this how, how do we compile this into a machine level language where the machine level language really has only this kind of instructions has basically loading has structured uh, unstructured uh, jumps or structured jumps unstructured uh, uh, jumps which be, co could be conditional or unconditional so we have a complicated expression we want to execute it with registers and simple instructions like loading comparing and jumps so first we can we can execute this code or we can translate this code compile this code into no short, short short circuit version so with no short circuit version we basically first load the value of a a location in memory into register one then the value of b into register two then we would compare r1 with r2 and allocate the result into register one so basically if r1 is greater than r2 which means a greater than b then we remember that in register 1 then we load into register 2 we can reuse it because it's not useful to us we are not using b anymore anywhere in the expression so we can load c into register 2 d into register 3 we can compare register 2 with register 3 and store the result in register 2 then if we need to compute the conjunction we execute the conjunction between register 1 and register 2 and again store it in register 1 so now when we continue 
we can actually load into register 2 the value of E, into register 3 the value of F, into register 2 we can load if register 2 is, great, it is different than register 3, which is basically comparing E to F, and again we can compute the value of the entire Boolean expression into register 1 as register 1 or register 2. And now if the register 1 is false, is 0, then we can jump to a label that is the starting of the else clause. Otherwise, we continue the execution of the then clause. And when we finish the then clause, in order not to execute also the else clause, we go to a label that occurs after the else clause. Basically, the first statement after the else clause, after the if sta statement, the entire if statement. So if we finish the else clause, we just continue the rest of the code. So this would be like a compilation of this higher level if statement into a machine language. And it's very, very general. Basically, we don't consider any specific uh, assembly language like MIPS or target language like uh, uh, Intel 8x86 or x86 64-bit. No, we basically have a very low level uh, general abstract language. Now, if we do short circuit, short circuit says that if in a conjunction, if an operator operand is uh, false, then the entire conjunction is false. We can directly jump to executing other terms. So in this case, we load into R1A, we load into R2B, and if R1 is less than equal with R2, we jump to label 4. That means that if this, op this uh, comparison is false, we jump to executing the second part. We, don't, we skip, we optimize the code, we skip the execution of the inner part. So we, what we can see here is that we can write it with an if statement, but more generally we can write it with actual assembly lower level jump instruction. So we actually use in this case jump if less than equal. If this condition is false, if we didn't jump, we continue loading to the register R1 because we don't need A anymore, C. We load into register R2D and again we do a conditional jump. If R1 is greater than R2, then we go to label L1, which is basically here. Otherwise, we just continue the instructions. We load E into R1, we load F into R2, and if R1 is equal with R2, we jump to L2. Basically, if we, we have the opposite of this, now we know that this is false, and we are here because this was false, the conjunction was false, so now we can jump directly to the else clause which is L2. Uh, if, uh, we were f uh, if the condition was true, either that we basically had the first part was true, the conjunction was true, or the second part was true, that basically the uh, R1 is different than R2, which is E and F, then we execute the then close, and we jump to the statement after the if statement. Basically, again, we jump to L3. So one thing you can actually see in this in this code that in most cases if we have conditions that are false or conditions that are true in in these junctions we actually execute less number of statements in this case everything got executed up to the then clause basically up to this if statement this was executed no matter what so many statements are executed even if they are not necessary while in the case of short circuit we can actually see that if conditions are true or false, it will actually execute less code. Even the entire code is less that gets executed. You see the number of statements is less than the number of statements that we had before. Okay, But that's not that, as important as uh, the fact that we basically uh, execute less statements. We will have more examples like this when we talk about Java, because in Java we have both conditional and unconditional operators. We have both short circuit and non, no, not short circuit, which is the opposite here. Any questions? Yes, 
you are right in many languages there are different register number of registers different registers with different sizes and so on uh, that's why we are talking at least this is not the truth is that this is not a computer organization class or a computer architecture class this is a compilers uh, programming languages implementation class so we actually are learning the concepts of how compilation works we are not learning in any specific programming language if you want for specific programming languages i advise uh, csc 220 and 320 which actually do it for higher for uh, lo basically specific programming languages but adam is completely right uh, i'm not doing it here in x86 64 or x86 or mips as a matter of fact i'm just doing it at very high level okay so talking about java java has both operators has short circuit operators double ampersand and double vertical bar and unconditional operators which basically execute both operands no matter what conjunction and disjunction single unpercent and single vertical bar so here i have examples for those of you that may not know this for instance if x is one in all of these statements one greater than one is false so with a double unpercent conditional source short circuit operator the second operand is never executed so the value of x after this expression is 1 because this was false 1 less greater than 1 is false same if x is 1 1 greater than 1 is false and 1 greater than x plus plus will still be executed because this is unconditional conjunction so x will be actually post incremented with 1 although the condition was false Similarly for disjunction, if x was 1, then 1 equal 1 is true. With the short circuit ver two vertical bars disjunction, it basically means that the entire disjunction is true, no matter how the second one, second operator is executed or not. So it's not executed for optimization reasons. Therefore, x is still 1 after we do this disjunction. However, when we have unconditional disjunction, we actually increment x with 1. Even if the condition is true, and we knew that from the first operand. So, this will actually tell us that internally, if we compile Java uh, uh, expressions, they will actually be compiled differently uh, depending on the operator that we are using. And again, I'm not using Java bytecode. Java bytecode is the machine le uh, level, double quotes, basically, uh, the machine level version of an assembly that runs on the virtual Java virtual machine. So in this case, I'm basically translating that again, these expressions into how it actually is done internally in an abstract way. I could do it, and in fact, uh, I did read and write uh, Java bytecode uh statements but is not needed in this case so with unconditional operators this statement would be basically executed completely we load a we load b we compare them we store the result in r1 we load c into r2 and d into r3 because we don't need r2 anymore we basically compute the value into r2 and then we can compute the value of the entire disjunction into R1. Then we load E and F into R2 and F. And again, we compute the value into R2. We load G and H into R3 and 4. We compute the value into R3. We execute the disjunction into R3, R2. And then we execute the conjunction into R1. And we get the true value for the entire Boolean expression. And now we jump if R1 is 0, that means if the condition is false, we jump after this if statement, some label L1, otherwise we continue executing I. Okay, but what now if we have conditional operators, that means that some of these expressions do not need to be executed. So we basically can use conditional jumps, like if 
the opposite of if this condition is true because this is a disjunction then we don't need to execute the second condition so we load a and b into a register r1 and r2 and if r1 is less than r2 less than equal with r2 we jump to l1 which basically is the second part of this conjunction otherwise we have to execute the first part so we load c and d into registers r1 and r2 we don't need the register r1 anymore and if this is uh, again if uh, uh, now we do the opposite if this is false then the entire conjunction is false because this is a conditional conjunction so if L r1 is less than or equal with r2 which is the opposite of this then jump to l3 which is the first statement after the entire if statement if it was true then we just continue the rest of the statements in in this uh, second part of the conjunction so at this label l1 where we jumped either if this was true or if the entire thing was true we continued we load into the register r1 e and we load into the register r2 f which basically will give us uh, e and f and we don't need the register r1 anymore basically we just continue i think i have an extra line there but i don't know why it's part of the image okay so in that case we basically uh, if the condition is true we can jump directly to the label to execute i if the condition if the condition is false we continue and we again do the opposite here if g is greater than or equal with h then we jump jump to l3 otherwise we just continue so this will give us the minimum number of registers minimum number of lines of code that need to be executed to do short circuit for all of the operators any questions this is extremely important because you should be able to think about how to compile this structured programming expressions into machine level code in a similar way and again we are using the same set of conditional unstructured flow uh, operations that we learned here statements that we learned here i included four examples in the lecture notes and i included four examples in the sample final exam which uh, I want to make sure that everybody understands. Any questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, let's see another example. And this example mixes, basically, in the second part, we have a condition, unconditional operator. So in the previous case, we had a jump in the middle of executing the second part, now modifying it a little bit, and there is no jump basically we compute the value of this comparison in r1 then the value of this comparison in r2 the value of the entire disjunction in r1 and then we jump if r1 is zero outside the if statement otherwise we continue the then close for this if statement okay selection statements so case statements are basically less verbose and more efficient than if statements cascading if statements why because we compute that expression only once and in most cases we also apply a hash function to actually find exactly where do we jump to execute only that part either through uh, with a hash table or with uh, 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 basically a hash function iteration the simplest variant of a while loop uh, the simplest variant of loops is usually defined with while loops it looks like an if statement if you replace the while with an if it's basically an if statement while the condition is true execute the body and then come back and check the condition if it's still true execute the body and then come back and check the condition and so on do while loops have the condition after the block there are four variations which in many cases the force are defined in terms of while loops in fact while is the most uh, general and then there are for loops and here we have a for loop in uh, pascal for every i from 0 to 100 
with the step of 10, execute the code between the do and the end statement. In fourth run, it would be do for i equal 1 to 10 with a step of 2, this code. In fact, the modern, modern for loop is a variant of the while loop. Uh, C defines it exactly to be precisely first have the uh, in, uh, action before the uh, loop, like in the case of i is uh, assigned the first value, then a while that imp that implements the the body the if the condition is is true, then execute this body of the for loop, followed by the action after each iteration, which usually increments i with a step. Uh, the recommendation or the requirements for some languages is no changes to bounds within the loop. So basically the point is do not change last inside the loop. It's a recommendation in some languages is a requirement. In Java or C you can modify last in, inside the loop. You cannot modify for, a, for each loop. A loop that iterates over a collection, you cannot delete or add elements to the collection inside the loop. The compiler will tell you that that is not allowed. Okay. So how do we generate code for such for loops? Like for instance, we had a previous for loop. We would basically load the re into register one first, register two step, register three last, and then if register R one is greater than R three, go to outside the loop. Then we have the loop body you increment the register r1 which is basically the iteration variable with the step and then you would go back to check the if r1 is greater than r3 so what is a problem with this basically example if we compile for loops this way is it efficient and i want to think you to think a few seconds about it so Basically, the point is, let's say that we have this for loop and we compile it into the statement below. Let's actually just write it here. So we compile it into the stuff that is below. So one thing that you may notice is the fact that at each iteration we actually execute two jumps. One conditional jump and one unconditional jump. So the answer is that there is another code that is actually cheaper. And that code basically says, go to the end first, and then execute a conditional jump. If R1 is less than equal with R3, jump to L1. Which basically will execute at each iteration only one conditional jump, instead of one conditional and one unconditional. So it's a faster implementation because each iteration contains a single conditional jump rather than a conditional branch at the top and an unconditional jump at the bottom. So this is again assembly code for or abstract assembly code let's call it for the same for loop that we had before but it has a better efficiency. Basically the compiled code for the same code is basically much cheaper. Okay, let's just make sure that this is cleaner if uh, once you have them in the lecture notes. Okay, any questions? No questions. Okay. So, also for each loops, use usually an iterator. It puts values from an iterator object. For instance, range in Python is an iterator object. It basically uh, doesn't get evaluated on the spot. 
it gets evaluated by generating one single one result at every step it checks if it has an x value and if it does it takes that x value users can define their own iterators like for instance if you want to iterate over the elements of a tree uh, you can do it in pre-order uh, basically it will create an iterator for the tree and return the elements or uh, one by one however as i mentioned earlier for for loops uh, most languages if not all uh, require that you don't make any changes to the loop uh, variable within the loop so you you are not allowed to for instance add elements to the tree or delete elements from the tree during the iteration there are also loops that check the conditions at the end of the loop like repeat until loops or do while the condition is true loops so they are post test loops whose condition works either in uh, repeat until the condition becomes true or repeat while the condition is true so basically until the condition becomes false and again they are written in terms of how would they be evaluated as a while loop so all of these loops are basically equivalent in matters of complexity they have equal expressivity however uh they basically it's a matter of personal choice which loop you should use in many pro programming languages you have while loops for loops do while loops or re repeat until loops and it's a matter of personal preference which one you want to use also it's common to actually do uh, checks inside the loop so for instance you may have an infinite loop like the one that is written below and you can check a condition inside the loop and break outside the loop the moment that that condition becomes true so this is a program that basically reads every line but if the line is empty it exits the loop it doesn't consume the line and you can do it either with a break or in fact in this case you can do it with a continue to jump empty lines However, in that case, you, must have, you might have another condition in the for loop. It's common to have this kind of infinite loops, especially if you are running servers which expect indefinitely, indefinitely uh, uh, connections from clients. Recursion is equal powerful with iteration. In fact, in many programs, there are mechanical transformations back and forth. Uh, for problems that are defined recursively, like for instance, let's take Ackermann function or McCarthy function, uh, it's very difficult to write, if not impossible, to write uh, uh, iterative versions, especially like you need to use data structures like stack, stacks to implement your own version of uh, recursion. So sometimes it's less, less intuitive to write programs using recursion. Uh, the naive implementation of recursion is less efficient than iteration because at every step you have to allocate another uh, stack frame or activation record on the stack and copying values is slower than updating in iterations. However, there are advantages of recursion is fundamental to functional languages like SML and Scheme and it requires no special syntax like while loops and for loops that reserve certain keywords for uh, meanings inside the language. But as I said, it's actually a matter of uh, the problem. So there are problems like Ackermann and uh, Ackermann is a good example. It was the second invented uh, non-primitive function a recursive function and it's very difficult you have to implement a stack yourself to actually implement that function as a iteration the first uh, non-primitive recursive function was actually invented by a Romanian PhD student of Ackermann at the beginning of the 19th century okay so recursion always can uh, mean most cases can be translated to iteration uh, most cases means really always and in fact you can think again of uh, how would you implement recursion with iteration by using jumps and uh, reusing the space 
of the current method that gets implemented, which actually takes us to the next optimization. Next optimization that we talk, to, talk about for uh, uh, recursion is called tail recursion. When the recursive call is the last call in the current execution of the method. In that case, we really don't need another frame on the stack. All that we need to do is to assign to the current frame variables a, a and b the values of expressions a minus b and b or a and b minus a. So really what it means is in tail recursion is that we don't allocate another stack frame. We are just jumping back to the beginning of the method and then we execute in the same stack frame. In fact, many languages do tail recursion, automatic tail recursion. They detect when variable, uh, when uh, recursive calls are done as last statement in the current method, and in that case, it calls the same, it use, reuses the same frame on the stack. So dynamically stack space is unnecessary and the compiler will reuse the space belonging to the current iteration when it makes a recursive call. Many compilers do it. There are compilers that don't do it, like for instance uh, Python, and uh, we saw problems with rec uh, highly, like de de very high depth recursion in homework 2. But in fact, uh, uh, I personally wrote a module in Python that allows uh, one to uh, write that the method is uh, uh, tail recursive by just using an annotation, and that will be internally compiled into a tail recursive method that reuses the same space on the stack. My module does many, many other things. Uh, memoization, which is another topic that we'll talk later, and parallel computation. So let's see if there are any questions. Okay, no questions. Okay, so when we call methods, which is a topic that we'll talk later this semester, we assume implicitly that arguments are evaluated before passing them to the method. This not not be the case. This doesn't need to be the case. It's possible to pass the representation of the unevaluated arguments to the subroutine instead, and to evaluate them only when they are needed, like lazily, lazy evaluation. The former option that we always uh, basically execute and evaluate operands uh, uh, arguments is called the applicative order evaluation. The latter one, the lazy one, is called the normal order evaluation, where you only evaluate operands when you need them. So lazy evaluation is a case of normal order evaluation, where you basically, in the absence of side effects, expressions are only evaluated when the value of that expression is needed. You basically delay the expression until you, you, you need it. Uh, evaluating the expression until you need it. Such delayed expressions are called promises. We promise to evaluate it when we need it. Many modern programming languages do this. They don't evaluate ex large expressions by default. They only evaluate them if they are needed, when they are needed. Memoization is actually a different topic. Is Instead of calling a function, so a function is guaranteed, is not a method, a function is guaranteed that given a set of inputs, it returns the value uh, computed from that function. A function basically says that given values in the domain, it always returns the same value in the codomain. Memoization says that if we call the function once and we already evaluated that function, if we call it again of, with the same arguments, then we don't need to evaluate it again. We just can give the value that was computed in the first case. So, memoization is actually uh, used in many programming languages, like for instance in XSB Prolog. You can apply memoization simply by doing a call. You can say that I want to table the reach predicate with two arguments. Or even simply, simpler, you can say auto table. Uh, 
all the predicates in this program. So this basically means that if you call once, let's for instance say I called reach of 1 and 4, and I found that is true, and later I call again reach of 1 and 4, the second one will just return true immediately. It will not actually trace anything. It will not basically execute. It will just say that I already proved this to be true and I know to be true. And similarly, if something was proved to be false, so this was obtained to be true after some number of steps. So this took some steps to prove to be true. And therefore, this tells us immediately that it's true without having to be executed. And similarly, if we ask something that is false, like is there a path from uh, 4 to 1, it will take some time, first time, to actually respond that no, there is no path from 4 to 1. But if we are asking the same question again, it will tell us immediately false. I know that it's, there is no path, I'm not going to compute it anymore. Okay, we will see when we do prolog and access B prolog in particular, in fact, Stony Brook prolog. Okay, that's all about control flow and we'll continue with data types next class. Any questions? So I hope that Blackboard will be fixed and I will post uh, the recording of today's lecture uh, on Piazza today because Blackboard is uh, broken. Oh, thank you very much. I will post it on Blackboard right now. And then I will uh, create the video and post it on uh, YouTube. Thank you very much for today. Any questions about the class?